uh, professor at the mathematical department at the University of Copenhagen and work in quantum information, quantum entanglement. He's also interested in self-testing of quantum computers, which is a very interesting and important problem. Now that we are making brief promises that we're going to have quantum computers working, and it's, she's going to tell us a little bit about the symptoms of trying to self-test quantum computers. OK, and thank you again, Laura, for being here with us. Um, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you um uh, for the nice introduction um let me just repeat for those who weren't there uh, in the very beginning i very much welcome you to stop me at any time and ask me questions i hope um, that i don't lose you during my talk that's my goal all right so i want to talk today about self-testing uh, which kind of um the idea of self-testing is that we want to verify that the quantum device is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And I've been thinking about self-testing for quite some time now um, together with members of my group. So, and this is kind of a joint work um, with um, uh, many of my group uh, members um, like Simone and uh, David and Tor um, and some theorems also by other group members as I will mention later on. All right, so let's kind of start with this warm up. Okay, so suppose that we have some quantum state psi, and right? we can describe it as a vector, um, as a unit vector in some complex d dimensional space. And I suppose that we have a bunch of measurements, mx, right? so this capital X is some set. And I think maybe you have three measurements with which you could think of measuring this state psi. Right, and I describe here these measurements using uh, their POVM elements, so positive sum depth dot operators, uh, EXA, right, that add up to identity if we sum over A, this outcome, measurement outcome, little a. All right, so now, according to quantum mechanics, right, we can, we can compute uh, what's the probability that if I choose measurement X and I measure the state psi, what's the probability to get each specific outcome A, right? So that, that is uh, what I call this P of A given X, the probability to get outcome A given that I measured state psi uh, with uh, this measurement X. Well, and it's simply given, right, uh, by this kind of sandwich, like so. So that's my probability. All right. So, so given this quantum mechanical description, this vector psi and these operators EXA, I can, com can compute these probabilities. But we could now think about the inverse problem, right? Suppose that I have some sort of box where I put in this X, kind of think this X is saying which measurement to perform. And I don't know what's going on inside this box, but out comes some little a. This measurement outcome kind of comes out. And suppose that I observe that uh, these probabilities, I, I, I repeat uh, this process many, many times, I gather the probabilities, and, and I see that, well, they give me the same probabilities as if I measured some specific state, state psi. Uh, with, with these measurements mx, right? The question would be, okay, can I can I kind of go the other way around and from seeing this p, can I infer what the state psi is and what these measurements m are? Okay, and if I don't know anything else, uh, right? Um, I just have this one box where I put in an input and out comes an output. Then of course, it's not hard to see that I cannot uh, say which state was measured with what measurements. In particular, it could be right that uh, there's just some classical process uh, inside this box. Any probability distribution could be produced by um, by a classical process. Okay, so now things change um, if if we assume something more in our setup, and specifically if we look at um, so the simplest Bell scenario, let's let's look at the two-party Bell scenario, okay? So on this, in this case, uh, we have two kind of separated boxes where we can enforce that they do not, um, uh, they cannot transmit classical information between them within some critical period of time, right? So that's kind of my A box or Alice box and Bob's box B, right? 
Um, so, so in this case, what what these boxes could be doing, right? Um, I'm going to call it a strategy S, right? I'm going to think of this strategy as a triple. So one is some bipartite state sign that's kind of pre-shared between these two boxes, A and B. And then I have some measurement on the A system or on Alice's system uh, given by these POVM elements AXA. So I think of uh, X as indexing the measurement and a little A as indexing the outcome. And similarly, I have some measurements uh, with their respective operators for Bob. Okay? And again, uh, I can compute the probability uh, to get specific outcomes, little a, little b, uh, conditioned on me having done this measurement x and y, respectively, uh, as this inner product. Right? Now I have a tensor product between uh, these Alice and Bob operators. All right. and, and, and again, in this scenario, I could ask this kind of inverse question, right? Given that I observe this, um, these probabilities, P of A, B given X, Y. So I'm going to refer to these as correlations. So given that I observe this correlation, so the, this is classical information, right? Uh, can I sometimes infer uh, what strategy uh, was being used to produce them? Okay. And so here, I assume that I have this promise or some way to enforce that there is no communication um, between these two boxes, A and B, in this critical time grid. All right. And here, the answer is yes, that sometimes we can do it. Um, and that is known as subtesting. So not for every probability distribution that is possible, um, but there are probability distributions uh, that have this nice kind of rigidity property that essentially there is just one strategy producing that um, probability distribution. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, what, what's the difference between these and quantum process tomography? Um, so I don't have, uh, so if I understand correctly about this process tomography, is so there you kind of trust that you know what your measurements are, right? You you trust something, you trust some device. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. So th that's exactly the difference here. Like uh -huh. um, we we want to infer this quantum mechanical description, right? The state and measurements from just classical observations. So, and the, so you're the you're not you're not assuming quantum mechanics from this. We are assuming quantum mechanics. So we assume quantum like the. Like if you want to be technical, you have to say, okay, my assumptions are uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, then I assume that there is no communication between Alice and Bob. And I think I also need some sort of assumption that I can make random choices. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. That somehow not the whole universe is predetermined. Or yeah, well, I'm, I'm not kind of testing uh, re reality, right? I'm not testing what is the true um, theory describing our world. I'm, I'm saying I trust this quantum mechanics, but maybe I don't trust my devices. Right? Maybe I don't trust the manufacturers of my devices, or I just, I'm worried that I have, my devices maybe are not characterized, right? There could be different reasons for why I don't have this trust. Maybe uncharacterized devices, maybe some, uh, they have been provided by some potentially curious or malicious entity. Okay, so then kind of um, in a nutshell, we could say that self-testing uh, are these tools or methods that allow us to infer quantum mechanical description from only classical observations. Okay. And what precisely these classical observations are could vary uh, depending on the scenario that we have. So uh, one, one thing that you could observe is like this correlation. So these probabilities, P of A, B given X, Y. So you're promised that you have some strategy. Um, and of strategy, I think of this triple of state, Alice's measurements, Bob's measurements, that produces this correlation. And you want to say, what is this strategy? If all I know is that it produces this correlation uh, P. Um, and now, in, in this case, you kind of, your classical observation consists uh, of many numbers, right? It consists of all this collection of probabilities. But in some cases, you could also uh, try to test from just a single number, say, maximal Bell violation or optimal winning, winning probability in a non-local game. 
Okay, so I'm going to take this non-local gain perspective, um, uh, but uh, one can uh, uh, analogously think about uh, bell inequalities as well. And um, kind of from a practical perspective, there is a little, um, uh, there is an advantage of kind of self-testing from a single number because um, it's kind of you need to collect these classical observations up to some accuracy, right? That means you need to run your experiment many times. So um, you need to run less experiments if you only need to estimate one number as opposed to all these uh, probabilities in your correlation. All right. So I'm going to try to explain what is a non-local game, and I'm going to do it on this example that is called a magic square game. Like kind of more generally, the game is um, defined by um, by its um, probability distribution on these inputs x and y, and then um, uh, the so-called verification function, which tells you which kind of answers win on certain questions and which lose. Hopefully, it's going to um, be uh, become quite clear uh, when we take a look at this example. So this example is magic, the so-called magic square game. Um, all right, so this game is based on this kind of three by three grid, uh, right, of these nine numbers, where each of these numbers uh, is plus or minus one. All right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, our questions are going to be that we ask Alice and Bob to kind of fill in with plus and minus ones one of the rows or columns in, in this three by three grid. Okay, so kind of this R1 that stands for uh, row one. So Alice has to say which value she assigns to this C11, C12, C13, for example. And then say C2 would mean second column. Um, and then uh, the answers, right, are uh, kind of uh, these strings of length three that simply we interpret them as assigning these values to the corresponding uh, variables C, I, J. Okay. And for probability distribution, it actually doesn't really matter. But let's, let's take just a uniform uh, probability uh, distribution. Uh, over uh, all the uh, questions. Okay, so um, I think I used it for, from some slightly different formulation of this magic square game. So in this case, I have six questions, right? So if I wanna take uh, for each party, so 36 questions in total, if I count a pair X, Y, right? So that would be one over 36. Okay. And what is my verification function or when do Alice and Bob win? Well, they win if they satisfy these two rules. Um, okay, so we, we look at the answers that they provided and first we want them to satisfy the parity rule. Uh, and the parity rule simply says that if I multiply all the things um, that they answered together, then this product should always be equal to plus one, except if I ask them, um, this column C3, the very last column. And in, in that case, I want uh, those plus and minus ones to multiply to minus one, okay? And then the second rule I want them to uh, satisfy is that uh, if I happen to ask them questions um, that kind of overlap, right? So I asked um, both of them to assign value to some variable. For instance, I asked uh, maybe um, Alice, for the uh, first row here, and I asked Bob for the third column, then in order to win, then this consistency rule is gonna say that they need to assign the same entry in this uh, very last, uh, in, in, in this entry uh, C13, okay? And in this case, the answer they provided does not satisfy that, right? Bob assigns plus one, but uh, Alice assigns plus one, but uh, Bob assigns minus one. So in this case, uh, they would lose. Okay. So, but we, we, you see um, both Alice and Bob satisfied this parity rule, right? So if I multiply uh, all the values that Alice responded over here, uh, then uh, I get minus one times minus one times one, that's plus one, right? Parity rule satisfied. For, for Bob, uh, he needs to multiply to minus one because I gave him this uh, third column and they indeed multiply to minus one. So parity rule is satisfied. 
um, right? Uh, but this consistency uh, rule is not uh, satisfied. And therefore they would lose in this specific instance. Now I could uh, change uh, Bob's answer uh, so that they win, for instance. Uh, so I need to put a one here because I need him to be consistent with Alice. Um, but the overall product I need to be equal to minus one. So let me add minus one there. And now in this case, um, they would win if they responded in this manner. Okay. Uh, now, when when you're given a game like that, uh, the first thing that we usually ask ourselves is, oh, is there a, a classical strategy or deterministic strategy that wins uh, this uh, this game with with probability one, so that wins irrespective of the questions uh, x and y that we choose to send. Now, because of this consistency rule, um, it's uh, not too hard to see that if Alice and Bob have some sort of strategy for uh, always winning this game, okay? So the strategy would simply be kind of a transcript of, okay, what is Alice gonna say if she's asked uh, first row, second, first row, second row, so for all the answers, uh, for all the questions, right? So, um, and similarly for Bob. So essentially it's just a function, right? Um, and because of this consistency rule, uh, you can uh, see that, well, these functions need to be the same and actually they would amount to kind of filling in of this three by three grid uh, with value of cij so that these parity rules are met and so that along every row i multiply to plus one and then except for the very last column where i need to multiply to minus one. and and it's impossible to fill in plus and minus ones in such a manner and the way you can see it is by taking, um, you can compute um, the product of all the CIJs in two different ways, right? One is by first multiplying along every row and then taking the product of the row products. In that case, you conclude that the overall product is equal to plus one. Okay, Esse, that's one. Sorry, is, is there? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That is, uh, that is the microphone is, is not, open. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Jose, who did the yeah. I think it's cool. But I think that now Jonathan has a question. Daniel, are you there? Yeah, please. Uh, I cannot see maybe if someone raises yeah. a hand, I might not be able to see. So just whenever or I, I can breath, yeah. feel free to, um, to ask the question. Yeah, sorry, uh, I couldn't find where to raise my hand. Um, yeah, please. I'm saying please don't raise your hand. Please just interrupt me. Okay. Uh, I, I think I missed something. So when mm -hmm. you when you are giving your x and y, mm -hmm. is, it, is it mandatory that one is from the row and the other is from a column, or can they both be rows and both be columns? They could both be rows and both be columns, and in that case, we would say that Alice and Bob always uh, win. So I think maybe uh, so, so. There are many different ver uh, formulations uh, of magic square game, and they are essentially equivalent. There are, are versions where you only ask rows to Alice and columns to Bob. Um, yeah, but you might as well just uh, equally well ask them both rows and columns. How can they possibly, if they can get asked the same rows and the same columns, then they, all the assignments have to be the same. Otherwise, yes, they yes. If they are asked the same column, say column one, then they need to answer with the, the same string. That's correct. Okay. All right, then, then pretty clear that classically they, they, they would need to have the same nine assignments predetermined. Yeah, but that, that's also true even if you just ask, say, Bob, Columns, and Alice Rose, that would still okay. need to hold that property. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, right, okay. Um, so what I was trying to argue before that it's impossible to fill in this three by three grid with plus and minus one so that uh, these row products and column products uh, are as, um, oops. 
as uh, as shown in in this square. And and the reason for that is if I first multiply along the columns and uh, along the rows and then take uh, the row products and multiply them together, I conclude that the overall product is plus one. Whereas if I first did a column product, right, and then multiplied um, those column products together, I would conclude that the overall product is minus one. Okay. So that's a contradiction. So therefore, it's not possible to win this game classically uh, using a deterministic or more generally if just any classical strategy. It's impossible to win it um, perfectly. Okay, but um, in contrast in, in to the classical case, quantumly there is a strategy. I'm gonna refer to this strategy as S tilde sub magic square. Um, that allows us to always win irrespective of which row and column uh, we ask Alice and Bob. And um, the shared state in this uh, strategy uh, is just this maximally entangled state in four dimensions, or uh, equivalently, you can think of it as two EPR pairs. Um, and then I have written down um, the measurements that Alice and Bob do um, in, in the square here, okay? So sort of what you should think of, uh, so suppose Alice is asked to fill in the first row. So then what she's gonna do is um, she's gonna me uh, measure uh, to, to figure out what, what should uh, she assign to the C11 entry over here. Uh, she's gonna measure uh, X on her first qubit and identity on the second qubit. Um, and then um, that's, uh, and, uh, and, and take, take the product of these uh, um, outcomes, and that's what she's going to assign here, right? And then she's going to proceed to measure this observable and this observable. And be, because they all commute, right, I can actually measure them all at the same time, or equivalently, I can think that I first measure this, then this, and then this. The order doesn't matter here. Okay, and that's a property of this filling um, that I that the observables that I have written uh, in every row and column they are pairwise commuting, which means I can measure them at the same time. So um, uh, that is one property that this satisfies, um, and um, another property that uh, this filling satisfies is that if I take the product along every row or column. Except for the very, uh, except for the third um, column, then I get uh, plus one. So the way you should take, by, by the way, I'm skip. There, there is a tensor product between this like x and i. Uh, I'm just using the shorthand, so I don't have to write tensor product um, every every time. So for, so for example, if you look at this first row, right? If I multiply all these things together, what I see, I get x squared on the first qubit and x squared on the second qubit. Now x squares to identity, so I get plus identity. Okay, and then um, kind of because uh, like if I look at this very last column, right, where I want to get minus identity, then what you need to observe is that if I take x times z. Then I get um, I times Y uh, a matrix, and then I get Y square, right? Uh, minus I times Y square, but I have minus I twice, once from first system, once from second system. And that gives me um, this minus one factor in front of identity. Okay, and then kind of by the properties uh, of uh, a maximal entangled state. Um, when if Alice and Bob perform the same measurement, then they get the same outcome. Okay, and that's where you get this consistency uh, from. Okay. That's why this consistency would be satisfied. All right. Um, now, any questions about maybe the general setup of a non-local game or um, or magic square in particular? I assume that maybe some of you or most of you have already seen this game. Okay. All right. So now remember that this idea of self-testing, right? That was that we wanted to only look at some classical observations. Let's say we we have some box that always wins this magic square game, right? Uh, and from that, we would like to infer a kind of quantum mechanical description 
of what's going on. So what is the state? What are the measurements being done? Okay. So now informally um, stated in this, um, this theorem that says that magic square game is a self-test, that says that this kind of back backwards inference is possible in the case of magic square, it would say the following. Okay, so this is informal statement and we'll get to the kind of fine print uh, later on. Okay, so this would say that if I have some perfect strategy, some strategy that always wins this magic square game, then this strategy S is essentially uh, this S tilde magic squares that I um, uh, defined up there. So in, in particular, the state that it uses is essentially um, these uh, two EPR pairs. Okay, now let's let's try to formalize uh, and uh, specifically understand well, what what does this essentially hide? Okay. All right. So now imagine you have you have this bell scenario, right? So you you perform some measurements um, x and y, um, and you have some strategy in mind. Okay, so you Alice measures uh, these operators, Bob measures these operators on some fixed state side tilde. Now, given this description, we can easily get to this correlation to these probabilities, right? Just using this sandwich. All right, um, and now we could ask ourselves, how can we change this S tilde so that P tilde remains un unchanged? So what transformations on the strategy we cannot see at a level of correlations, okay? So because if there's something we cannot see, then of course we will never be in able to infer that. Okay. So I want to show you two general transformations on the strategy that leave this uh, correlation or the probability distribution generated unchanged. So one is, you should think of it as a local change of basis. So if I take some uh, unitary on Alice and unitary on Bob, then uh, from this strategy S tilde, I can get a new strategy S1, where I apply uh, this unitary on Alice and then unitary on Bob on the state, and then I kind of also change my basis uh, for the operators. So I conjugate the operators. Okay. So if you compute uh, the, uh, the correlation generated by S1, you will easily see um, that these unitaries cancel out and you get the same correlation as generated uh, by S tilde, okay? So this generates the same uh, correlation as S tilde, so P tilde. Okay, so another general transformation that you can do is uh, instead of just having this state side tilde, Alice and Bob can also have an additional state on a sign. Okay, so think of this ox state as being shared between Alice and Bob, right? And then what they do is, well, they do nothing on this additional state. And then of course, this is not gonna affect the correlation that they get. So this also generates P tilde. Okay. So whenever we say that we can infer this quantum mechanical description from classical observations, it's always up to these two transformations. We cannot hope to get rid of them because they, whenever we do them, that leaves this, uh, our observations unchanged. Okay. So these two transformations was kind of, you should think of them as being the basis for the following definition, okay? So first I'm gonna define a relation uh, between two strategies. So when I write S tilde, I kind of think that this is kind of my reference strategy, some strategy uh, that I have in mind, and S is uh, some strategy for which I only know that it produces this correlation, but maybe I don't know what exactly the strategy is. All right. Um, 
So given two strategies, S and S tilde, um, each with their respective states and measurements for Alice and Bob. So for the tilde strategy, I use the same kind of um, variables. I just put tildes on all of them. Okay. But we say that S can be locally dilated to S tilde, and I denoted using this arrow notation. If I can find two isometries, UA and UB, so these isometries go from the space of my strategy S to the space of my strategy S tilde, answer some auxiliary space that I call A prime and B prime. And there also exists this state uh, on this auxiliary space, such that if I apply these is isometries to this strategy S, or more precisely, the action of the strategy S on the state, then I recover my, uh, uh, my canonical strategy S tilde. Okay. So this is equal to uh, how the canonical operators A tilde and B tilde how they act on the canonical state. And then nothing is being done on this auxiliary state. All right. So now this is the definition of what it means for one, uh, one strategy to be a local dilation of another. Right, so you there, you can find these isometries that map one strategy to this S tilde. That's how you should think about it. Now, when let's make one observation. If this equation one holds, uh, you could fix uh, your questions x and y and take a sum over little i a and b in this equation one. Now these are measurements. So if I sum these a x a's these over A with X fixed, then I get identity. And similarly for Bob's operators, right? If I sum over little b, then I get identity. And there, and from that observation, I can see that if I apply that, uh, those isometries UA tensor UB to psi, then what I get is psi tilde tensor is auxiliary state. Right, and one observation that we can uh, make is that if I if I can dilate uh, locally dilate this uh, strategy S to S tilde, then they necessarily generate uh, the same correlation. You can, I mean, essentially by also by thinking that you insert here identity, uh, which you express as U A star U A tensor. Um, UB star UB, you kind of see that um, the expression here on this left-hand side can be seen as arising from strategy of this type where you have changed the basis. Um, right? So this is uh, saying that kind of I can I can change the basis uh, in this strategy S and then it's just going to be this strategy S still the tensor, this auxiliary state on which I do nothing. So these two strategies, they generate the same correlation and, and therefore I cannot ever hope to tell them apart via these classical observations. But then uh, what self-testing asks is then that this is my only freedom, um, that up to this, these transformations, these are all the optimal strategies for my game. Okay, it says that game G is a self-test for the strategy reference strategy S tilde. If for any optimal strategy S, I can map it with this local unit reason. I can find this local dilation and dilate it to this S tilde. Okay. Um, now, whenever you try to apply these things um, in some actual experiment, then um, you can never say that 
you can really observe that some strategy is optimal. You always have some error. Actually, there are two sources of error. One is any experimental error that you have. Uh, and the other one is that uh, arises from finite sampling, right? Um, you, you can only run your experiment so many times. You can never learn precisely this correlation. You can learn it only up to some uh, precision. Okay, so more generally, we're kind of interested in robust self-tests. Um, so that kind of says, okay, uh, if you're, um, uh, for any desired closeness of, to your reference strategy, you can identify closeness of observations. And then if that is satisfied, then you can guarantee that whatever the, uh, was going on in these black boxes are, uh, can be locally dilated to something that's uh, epsilon close to your reference strategy. Okay. And here are some questions um, that we were interested in answering. So even though it seems that like the self-testing, it's a desirable feature for a non-local game to have, right? People write papers proving that certain games are self-tests. It somehow seems that, oh, as soon as you take um, a game with quantum advantage, meaning that its quantum value is strictly greater than the classical value, then it is a self-test of its optimal strategy, okay? Um, so what, what we wanted to know, is it true that every game G is a self-test for its optimal strategy? And another question we wanted to understand is, it also always seemed that, oh, whenever um, someone proved uh, that some game is a self-test, and actually that argument you could kind of um, do some Cauchy-Schwartz inequalities and or analyze things more closely, still following kind of essentially similar steps and prove that this self-test is actually robust. Okay. So uh, is it the case that every self-test is actually robust? And, and we, moreover, um, like one indication of why this could be true is that uh, we know that if you have proved your self-test using some particular group theoretic technique, uh, in that case, you can uh, use um, stability uh, theorems for, um, uh, for uh, near representations of groups to infer that as soon as you have a self-test, you actually also have a robust self-test. Okay? So certain classes of proofs kind of can always be promoted to robust proofs. Okay. So is every self-test robust? All right. First, of, uh, first uh, observation I want to make is that uh, like to the, this question one, um, for it to, uh, the, the short answer uh, to this question one is no, because there was a very nice example um, uh, provided um, by David uh, uh, Tsui and others, um, where they constructed this, what they called glued magic square game. All right, so um, this glued magic square game, it essentially consists of two magic squares. Uh, all right, so you can again think that Alice, um, Alice and Bob, they each get like either a row or a column. Uh, in this set where one of these columns is kind of this long column. And then in order to win, they need to satisfy the same kind of consistency rule. So if they are asked the same variable, they need to answer, assign the same uh, value to it. And uh, they need to, and the parities are shown in this picture. So the parity is always plus one, except for this long column, you want to multiply it to minus one, okay? And then you can notice uh, that you can win this game by playing uh, the optimal magic square strategy in this upper uh, square. In this lower square, you can just always assign plus one. So that's one strategy that always wins this game. But also you can win it kind of the other way around where you play magic square in this lower uh, square and then play trivially. So always assign plus ones to all the C variables. Okay. Now these two um, strategies, they produce different correlations. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and therefore, we know that uh, we cannot uh, map them to the same strategy as tilde. And therefore, it follows uh, that this glued magic square is not a self test. However, what we were able to show um, to, together uh, with Tor and Jitendra is that actually this glued magic square. Uh, still self-test the state. Okay, so the optimal state actually in both of the strategies that I described is still the state uh, from the magic square strategy. So kind of these two copies uh, of EPR. Okay, so kind of while we know that this magic square, a glued magic square is not a self-test of the full strategy, it's still a self-test for the state. So we can show that for any optimal strategy S for this glued magic square, we can always map this uh, state uh, to uh, these two EPR pairs. So the uh, state from the magic square. So we modify um, our question and instead we ask, does every game with quantum advantage self-test its optimal state, psi tilde, right? So not the full strategy, but just the state. Could that be true? All right, so now these are two questions. Is every self-test robust? And does every game with quantum advantage self-test um, some quantum states, I told you. Uh, Laura, and, yeah. when you, now when you're talking about self-testing uh, just for one state, so yes. up to local uh, operations, I guess, and, and so that's basically, you. You, you want to you 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 want to tomograph the state. You want to find out what the state is, uh, not not an, the entire set of things. But that's just just yeah. That's just inferring state state inference, if you want, right? Yes, just the state, not the measurements. Like kind of uh, that's why I kind of also wrote these two equations. So sometimes people only care about self testing the state, and then the, that's this equation too. But the stronger statement is where you want not just the state, but also the measurements, right? And saying this glued magic square, it's not a self-test for the whole strategy, so that which includes measurements. So this equation one fails, but equation two could still be true. So, so in this case, I'm only asking, can I say something about the state uh, that allows me to win um, to, that allows me to win this game. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. All right. And so for both of the questions, okay, so first of all, let me say, it would be really nice if the answer to question two was yes, that every self-test is robust because some of you have to work much harder to prove robustness. Like it's much trickier. You have to take care of all your deltas and epsilon. So it would be very nice that you only needed to prove this exact statement with no epsilons and deltas, and then uh, kind of this robust statement that you that is that you actually care about in, in the real life, that that just follows for free. Uh, unfortunately, what we show is that, well, the answer to both of these questions is no. So, and not every, so we give counter examples, right? Uh, we provide games uh, that uh, do not self-test and um, any state and uh, that also uh, give us an example of a non-robust self-test. Laura, can, I mean, maybe, I, sorry. May, I also have a, let me see if I understood correctly this definition of self-testing. You are mm -hmm. saying that the game is self-testing at the end if it, any any optimal strategy is equivalent to the to the optimal strategy under this uh, yes. Okay. yes exactly so whenever I have an optimal strategy I can find these local isometries that map yes. this arbitrary strategy to this reference strategy okay. Okay. kind of that's how I think about it in my head okay okay Perfect. um all right. And both of these counterexamples are can be provided by this construction that I call, call the OR game. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to take OR of two games. And, and later on, I'm gonna show you how to instantiate 
uh, this OR game to get the counterexamples. We take G1 and G2 be two non-local games, and then we define a new game. Okay, this is the notation that I use for it. So G1 or G2. Uh, what are the questions in this new game? So Alice gets a pair of questions where one question comes from the first game and the second question comes from the second game. And similarly, Bob gets one question from the first game, one from the second. And then when they answer, they kind of think of that they need to say, I'm going to play game one or game two. That's what this I or J says, which game they are choosing to answer. Okay, And then they provide their answer, A and B. Okay. Now, how do they win this game? What's, what are the rules for winning this or game? Well, first we want that Alice and Bob choose to play the same game. So to win, we need that this I is equal to J. And second, we want that they win that game that they chose to play. Okay. But this, this pair A, B, right? So if I is equal to J, say, first game, then I want that this answer A, B is winning in the first game on questions X1, Y1. All right. Now, the kind of key property of this OR game that we're going to use is as follows. So suppose that we, that this game G1 and G2, they have, each of them has a perfect strategy. Call these strategies S1 and S2. Then this easily gives rise to two different perfect strategies for this OR game. Right? So in one strategy, the players will always choose to play game one. So this I and J will always be equal to one. And then they simply play according to this S1. And in the other strategy, they will always choose to play game two and play according to S2. And these are two different strategies because one of them only uh, outputs uh, i, j equal to one, and the other one only outputs i, j equal to two. All right, so let's see how to use this OR game uh, to get a game that does not self-test any state. So um, I'm going to take uh, or of magic square game. And uh, for game G2, um, I simply need to choose uh, any non-local game that has a perfect quantum strategy uh, with state, say, uh, where each Alice and Bob has a Q threat. I can tell you ahead of time, it's not so important what this G1 and G2 is exactly. What I want is um, that the dimensions of the states are co-prime. So for, for magic square, uh, the local dimension of the state uh, that Alice and Bob use is four. Uh, and here I just chose some game that has uh, local dimension three. And for you can get examples like that, say using Cohen's Becker games. All right. And then uh, three and four, they are co-prime, right? They have no uh, non-trivial common divisors. Now let me try to sketch why this works. So it will rest on this property that uh, the, I have two perfect strategies, uh, S1 and S2 for my OR game G. Um, and these strategies S1 and S2, they use states with co-prime dimension. All right. So the first observation is right that this OR game has perfect strategy S1 and S2, uh, one arising from perfect strategy from magic square, and that will have Schmidt rank or local dimension four. Uh, and in case of uh, strategy S2, that will arise from my perfect strategy for G2, which used uh, this three dimensional state. Okay, so um, just so we are all on the same page, right? If I'm get, given a bipartite state psi, um, then I can write down its Schmidt decomposition. Right, where these alpha i and beta i, uh, they are orthonormal 
sets of vectors. And let's say if I only include in this um, in this sum uh, my co Schmidt coefficients, these lambda as are called Schmidt coefficients that are strictly greater than zero, then the number of uh, these non-zero Schmidt coefficients, um, then that's the Schmidt rank, what I call Schmidt rank of, of my state. And if my state has full rank, right, uh, then it simply coincides with the dimension. All right. So how am I going to use uh, this co-prime property? So if so, we kind of proceed from contradiction. So let's assume that it was a self-test. Well, these strategies S one and S two they are perfect strategies. So they are optimal strategies for for this game, uh, for this game G. So if it is a self-test, then I must be able to map both S one and S two. To this strategy, to some strategy S tilde. What it means, right, is that I can find uh, these local isometries. They could depend on I. Um, that map um, each of these states to some reference state, tensor, and auxiliary state, which again can depend on I. But whenever notice that uh, these local isometries, they do not change the Schmidt rank of, of this state psi i. Right? So the Schmidt rank on the left-hand side is actually, actually the same as Schmidt rank of psi i. Because of this equality, then I know that that means that rank of psi i is equal to rank of psi tilde um, times the rank of this auxiliary state. Right. The part, bipartition that I'm looking at is the Alice Bob bipartition, right? So uh, this half of this state belongs to Alice and half of this state belongs to Alice. And now this rank of psi tilde, right? That's perfect strategy. Um, um, for, uh, for, for, my, um, for, for my game. So, um, and, and this is... Um, this game should have a quantum advantage. So this is not one. So this is strictly greater than one. So what it, what it tells me, right, that these two, uh, that the Schmidt ranks of psi one and psi two have a common divisor of this R tilde. And therefore they cannot be uh, co-prime. But in my example, my S1 and S2, they are co-prime. So I get a contradiction, right? So if I started um, by assuming the opposite of what I'm trying to prove, right? I tried to assume that this game is a self-test. Then I concluded uh, that uh, these S uh, Schmidt ranks of uh, Psi 1 and Psi 2 should have a common non-trivial device, but that's not true. So my initial assumption was false. And therefore, it cannot be um, a self-test for any state. Yeah. So, sorry, just to get this clear, when mm -hmm. the, the OR game means that they can choose which of the two games they want to play or that they have to be prepared to play both games at random, either game? Uh, no, uh, they, they can choose. Um, see, they, they, this I and J, it, that means which game they're playing. Uh, so they choose to answer some particular I or J. Okay, it's not generated randomly, and then they have to play whatever it is. Okay. Yeah, I kind of we kind of giving them two a pair of questions, one from first game, one from second game, and we are telling them, oh, choose whichever one you want and play it. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but case, then uh, we are asking that they choose the same one. Okay. No. Okay. In that case, because I, I was thinking that they would have to have. They would be prepared to play either of the games in which case. Yeah, that would kind of be the end game, right? Like I would call that the end, like if I had to come up with a name for that, I would call okay. it the end game. So it's kind of what I'm thinking, my idea behind naming it is, is like we're telling them, oh, choose, play G1 or G2, whichever you want. Yeah. yeah. No, I wasn't thinking of an end game in the sense of having to play both, but. Mm -hmm. of of having to be prepared to play either but yeah yeah, yeah. 
Okay, okay, okay. No, no, that, no, okay, I agree. I agree with you. You're completely. Um, all right. So, um, and we can, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time. So all, all I will tell you is that you can also use um, this um, OR game to construct a, of an, uh, an example that is a non-robust self-test. And kind of the, the idea is there to take one of your games um, and just uh, what's important is that you have a game with perfect quantum strategy that is a self-test, right? And for the other game, uh, you take some game uh, that has quantum value one, but does not have a perfect quantum strategy. So having a quantum value one, uh, because the quantum value is defined as the supremum over all uh, achievable success probabilities, that just means that you must have a sequence of strategies uh, that can win arbitrarily well. So it doesn't mean that you have to have a perfect strategy. And this is a quite exotic game, but we have such examples of such games. So if you now combine kind of, kind of a simple game like Magic Square as G1 with this exotic game, G2, uh, then you get something uh, that is a self-test, uh, essentially because if you have a perfect strategy, then you need to play G1, and G1 is a self-test. However, when you're asking for robustness, now you are also allowing near optimal strategies. So now you can start playing G2, but these strategies you won't be able to map close to uh, this uh, reference strategy. You know, that's very hand wavy uh, explanation uh, of why this construction works. Uh, all right. so. I think uh, I will I will stop here and um, I'll be happy to answer uh, any more questions. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, so, is there any questions here? I mean, if someone is uh, in YouTube, you could also do your question there, and I can ask it here. I mean, I'm hogging all the time here, but I, I do have a question on this last um, argument. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, uh, again, uh, so your criterion was that you wanted to know if was it to, if all um, not all almost perfect strategies would be have to be close to a perfect one, or was it that every perfect strategy is robust in the sense that there are non perfect strategies close to it? Yeah. So I didn't kind of. Um spend much time on this robust definition, uh, the definition for robust self-test, okay? So uh, the idea behind robust self-test is that you will, so the exact self-test tells me if I see some classical observations, right? I can tell you that the strategy is essentially this one. Now robust statement says, if I see approximately these classical observations, then I can tell you, that your strategy is approximately this reference strategy, okay? Oh. Now, more formally, kind of, you have to uh, write down some kind of uh, epsilon delta definition. So I'm yeah. saying that for every uh, desired closeness of strategies, epsilon, so for every epsilon, I can find my needed closeness of classical observations delta, so that for any delta optimum strategy S, okay? So, now, that any, any strategy that wins your game with optimum probability minus delta, with at least that probability, then you can map that strategy S epsilon close to S tilde. Okay, okay. No, I, I, I got it. Uh, I, was, I was thinking in the inference way. Uh, I, I got the argument now. Uh, yeah, yeah this, this, it's very weird that you have this game that you can win at arbitrary precision, but not perfectly, <laughs> which you're using. Um, yeah, but we we don't have, I think, um, so I didn't talk uh, at all about open questions. I think one, I'm wondering, is it an artifact of, um, of, of, of this feature that I'm asking for a game? 
right? You can define this, you can self test from correlation rather than gain, right? So I would say uh, that um, correlation P is a robust self test. Um, like I could define it analogously to this, right? And then ask, does this persist? Uh, because the examples that we give, um, these strategies, they really generate different correlations. So um, they don't extend to counterexamples uh, for correlations. Right. So you, you're saying that you, you, if you if you change the question, you might get a completely different answer. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe I would still think that the answer is the same, but maybe it's harder to come up with counterexample. Well, okay. I, I don't know. Or maybe the question to ask is not um, is every self test robust, but under which conditions are there some nice general conditions when you can guarantee that you only need to prove exact self-test and robustness follows from proof. Okay, like in the group case. Yes. Okay. Any other question? <laughs> I mean, I have a very, very basic question. I mean, so in the beginning, you were talking about the bell I mean, the bell game, that was just two parts. You're going to say, oh, I have to calculate many, I mean, have to make many measurements because I want to calculate the probability. And then, I mean, this was a motivation to go to the magical square, no? But I mean, as far as I understand, I mean, the, the advantage of the magical square is that you don't have any inequality anymore, no? You really have. You can make a single experiment and you can prove that that result cannot be explained classical, no? But then no, you have it, to make it's not just a single experiment, but the number of so somehow to estimate each one of those numbers, you still will need to do many experiments. Right? Because in the bell inequality, any Alice and Bob just have to choose two directions, but in the magic square you have more measurements, no? You have, um, to make three you have to make three directions measurements, no? Isn't there? Each one has three options in the magic square, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, this uh, magic square is, you can also cast it as bell inequality. Like yeah, bell inequalities um, are more general than on local games. Okay. Anyone else? And I mean, in this kind of doing this uh, self-testing of, I mean, these games, I mean, can you use it to really, I mean, how it, it is applicable to the quantum computation? If I have a, a computation I want to do, how can I be sure it's really done that computation? This is self-testing uh, quantum computation. Uh, so like to apply this self-testing, you need some kind of separation, right? So it relies, like like I said, right in in this case, I cannot really say it, what what it's doing because it could be classical. Like if, yeah. Um, so I mean, you somehow need what what you can certify in this in this way is entangled states uh, and measurements. Maybe you should think of, uh, about. Uh, about these self-tests as kind of um, checking that your basic components function properly, rather okay, than so you, long so you're gonna just test that you're, Okay, you're going to test that your quantum computer has a real quantum state and you're really doing quantum operations, but you're not sure that it's really doing the quantum operation you want to. So, yeah, so, so this self-testing is kind of the maximally paranoid setting where you don't trust anything. Like you're saying, I don't, like some, somehow this, say, certification of quantum states, if you have trusted measurements, you can do tomography. Maybe that's expensive, but you can still do it, right? Um, so somehow this, 
uh, self-testing as something kind of, sometimes I like to explain it like, oh, imagine that you have a scale. I don't know. It's, I the, it's like device independent, no? Yes, and it's fully device independent. So somehow I think, oh, I have a scale. I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to draw a, a good scale. Uh, but suppose this, this square is a scale and then you have a block, right? So someone gives you this block and says, oh, it weighs one kilogram. Oh, and by the way, this is a scale, but I don't, but you think that you don't trust that this uh, weight actually weighs one kilogram and you don't trust that the scale functions properly. The question is, how do I check that the scale works properly and that this block of weight weighs one kilogram at the same time, right? So if I trust one of these objects, it's somewhat easy to imagine how I would go about testing, right? Like if I trust that this is one kilogram, I put it on the, on the scale and I check, what does it say? If it says two kilograms, it's wrong, right? Uh, but if I, if I don't trust any of, of the two things, how do I check? Yeah, okay, I see. Anybody else here in Zoom or in the team? Okay, I mean, if you don't have any further questions, I think I'm gonna thank Clara again. I mean, for talking about her work and what else. And thank you everyone that is me watching YouTube and also participate here in Zoom. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank, nice. thank you very much. Um, it was a great audience with uh, lots of uh, lots of questions and have a good weekend, guys. You too. Talk. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Thanks again for the invitation. Bye bye. Pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. Uh...